So, let's move on to the next thing. The next thing we're going to talk about is the idea of implicit differentiation. And I'm going to use this problem here that we've got set up. Uh, what I want to do, uh, what's the slope to the tangent line to the circle? Right, here's the equation um, of the circle. Center at the origin with the radius of 3. And so, I don't know, the point 2 squared of 5, I guess maybe that's the point 2. So, I guess that would be the point 2 squared of 5. Uh, what I want to know is, uh, what's the slope of this tangent line? And if I draw the tangent line through that point, what is the slope? Okay, well, the problem is, for number, well, there's two problems. Number one, the circle itself as a graph is not the graph of a function because it fails the vertical line test. Uh, and in order to uh, answer this question in the usual way, uh, I need to take the derivative, but right now I don't have a function to apply the derivative to. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to look at this in two different ways. I'm going to solve this equation for y and put this in function form. So starting from here, this equation needs to be solved for y. So let's see, what do I do first? Uh, that x squared has to be moved over. So y squared, 9 minus x squared. Uh, okay, now I've got y squared equals this thing. I don't want y squared, I want y itself. Uh, so what do I do next? Add the, apply the root law. And according to the root law, I get two solutions. I get plus or minus the square root. And what this shows, and now I can see the problem with the circle. The circle itself is actually represented by two separate functions. Right? On the one hand, I've got this piece on top. Right? If I look at this piece here, on the top part, this is the positive branch. This is the part where the y value is a positive number. So that's the upper half of the circle is represented by the positive root. On the other hand, this part down here, the lower half of the circle, this is the part that's being represented by the negative root. Now each one of these pieces separately does represent its own function because if I remove the bottom, then the top part satisfies the vertical line test and vice versa if I do the bottom. So each part of this represents a separate function. Uh, I can isolate, and, and for this example, which one do I need? If I'm trying to find the um, uh, slope of the tangent line at the given point, which of the two functions am I actually appealing to? Positive root. So for this example, I want y to be equal to that positive side, so this is my function. Now I can answer the question. Now I can answer this question the usual way. In order to uh, find the slope of the tangent line, I need the derivative. And this derivative here uses a couple of things. Number one, it uses the power rule for the square root, and then the chain rule for the inner function of composition. So by the chain rule, uh, one half. And what else? Is that it? Yeah, so I've got to get the derivative of the inside function minus 2x. And then I'll simplify this one half in front. We'll cancel that 2 that came out of that derivative. And then the negative one half power gives me the um, radical in the denominator. Okay, so I was able to take the function solve for y, find the branch of the function that applied to this particular problem, and now I can finally answer the question, what's the slope of the tangent line? Well, the slope of the tangent line is whatever the derivative is equal to at the given point. So whatever this turns out to be, um, x is 2, so negative 2 over 9 minus 2 squared, which is what? Negative 2 over the square root of 5. So that would be the slope of the tangent line to this curve at this point by explicitly, this is what we call explicit differentiation. I have explicitly expressed y as a function of x 
and then I used our standard differentiation rules to solve. Okay, but this is a lot of trouble to go to, number one. Uh, and number two, it was possible in this case, but there are situations in which this is not even possible. When the function or the equation that expressed is not a function and it can't be solved for uh, one of the variables, it can't be put into function form. So the question is, what's the alternative? Is there another way that we could have done this so that we could avoid having to explicitly state uh, the function that's involved in the equation? And the answer is yes. This is the process of implicit differentiation. So let's look at the alternative. We're going to assume that x is a function of y. So I'm assuming, so you always have to make that assumption because in the equation, and then diff, but that's not right. Um, in the equation itself, uh, the two very, especially for example, this equation, this equation that I started with, x and y are being treated equally. They're both on the same side, they're all mixed up together. There's really no precedence in this formula as far as who's a function of who. Uh, now, uh, traditionally, x is a, a y is a function of x, and so uh, this is supposed to be differentiate. Um, Um, so I'm going to assume that y is a function of x, and that'll be the traditional way in which we do this. I'm not going to rearrange the equation. I'm going to leave it just like it is. I'm going to take the derivative of the equation as a whole, term by term. So what I want to do now, I want to differentiate this whole expression. x squared plus y squared equals 9. And that means, term by term, I'm going to go through each one of these terms and take derivatives. So derivative of x squared with respect to x, the different of y squared with respect to x, and the derivative of 9. So I didn't rearrange anything. I go straight to the formula and apply the derivative with respect to x. And that's why we have to make an assumption. Which of our variables is going to be independent? Which is going to be dependent? I've decided x is independent, y is dependent. That's the... That's the uh, decision that you'll make in the homework. Okay, now we're going to differentiate. What's the derivative of x squared with respect to x? 2x. That's easy. And this one over here, what's the derivative of 9 with respect to x? 0. Those are easy. Those are just con That's just additional derivatives. The tricky part comes right here. What's the derivative of y squared with respect to x? Well, if I'm assuming that y itself is a function of x, this is a chain rule problem. This is a square of a function of x. So according to the chain rule, what's going to happen? Well, the first thing that's going to happen is I apply the standard power rule to the function itself. So that would give me uh, 2y. But because y is not the variable of differentiation, because y is a function of x, I get an extra factor. The extra factors of the chain rule is the derivative of that inner function of composition. That inner function is just a function y. I don't know anything else about it, but its name. But I do know what its derivative is going to be. It's going to be that. It's going to be dy dx. So please notice the difference between how I treated that first term and the second. I'm differenti differentiating with respect to x. So the derivative of x squared is 2x. That's just a standard power rule. But the derivative of y squared is more complicated because y is a function of x itself even though I haven't explicitly stated what it is. So 2y from the normal power rule and then this extra factor dy dx, that's the consequence of the chain rule. And again, even though I can't say explicitly what y is equal to, I do know that derivative. 2y, whatever y is, derivative of y, whatever y is. And now, I'm going to isolate the differential. All right, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to find the derivative by solving this equation for dy dx. So move the two, uh, subtract 2x from both sides. And then divide by 2y. And in the end, what happens? Well, over here on the left-hand side, I solved for the derivative. And over here on the right-hand side, 
two, the twos cancel, so what do I end up with? The negative of x over y. And please notice how this compares to our previous result. When we did this explicitly, what did we do? Well, we ended up with this by applying the derivative to the uh, actual function in the explicit form. But please notice this thing down in the denominator, that's y. That is y. So I end up with the same thing in both cases. I ended up with negative x over y in both cases. It's just that in the first case, I actually had an explicit definition for what y had to be. So I actually didn't need to appeal to y at all because I could replace it with an expression that involves x. In the case of the implicit differentiation, I really don't have a separate representation for y. I know it's a function of x. I know it satisfies the equation, but I can't give it any more precise definition beyond that. That's okay. I can still answer the same question. Right, the question was, uh, what's the slope of this at the point 2 square root of 5? Well, now I'm going to need both x and y. Uh, in the explicit sense, in order to evaluate a derivative, the only thing I need to know is the value of the x variable. But in the implicit case, I'll need both of them. So the slope of the tangent line in this case is going to be found by using those two results. X, uh, so in our formula here, dy dx, I need the point 2 square root of 5. So 2 goes in place of x, square root of 5 goes in place of y. Same result, didn't really matter how I did it. In fact, the implicit case is much simpler. It saved the extra step of having to actually solve the equation for y, and uh, the derivatives themselves were simpler because they didn't involve the radical, right? Solving this equation for y forced the radical into the expression uh, without uh, doing it implicitly. I, the only real rule I had to apply besides the chain rule was the power rule. So this idea of the implicit derivative is uh, uh, very powerful because it allows us to treat equations and answer questions about graphs that aren't themselves expressible as functions. And sometimes that's something we want to do. Okay, so there's, uh, there's a, there's a um, motivation for why we have implicit differentiation and uh, how it's done. Uh, we imp we uh, differentiate implicitly term by term. And anywhere the independent variable is involved, I'll always generate that extra factor of the differential dy dx through the chain rule. <coughs> Okay, so let's do a few of these examples. What's the derivative of this function with respect? So again, I'm telling you here, I want to know dy dx. This tells you exactly how the variables are going to be treated. Y is dependent, x is independent. I could just as easily have defined it the other way around because in this expression, our variables are being treated equally. There's no precedence. But by convention, we'll always choose x to be independent, y to be dependent. Okay, let's take the implicit derivative. So term by term, I'm going to differentiate. Anywhere that the variable y is not involved, that's just a standard differentiation rule. So once again, the derivative of x squared, that's 2x, no problem. The derivative of the constant, 18, that's 0, no problem. If the expression does involve the variable, then uh, the, in the dependent variable, then, same as before, uh, it becomes a chain rule problem of one, well, at least for example, well, here's one we've already done, we've already seen this one. The derivative of y squared, we just did that, by the power rule, it's equal to 2y, but because f of y is assumed to be a function of x, uh, we get that extra factor uh, through the chain rule, uh, just like we did in the previous case. Ugh. Darn it, just a second. Okay, but the trickier question comes here. What's the derivative, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and write this out. What's the derivative of 3xy with respect to x? 
Well, first of all, the 3 is constant, so it can come out front. I'll just let it sit there. Now the question is, x times y. How do I take the derivative of that expression? In particular, it's a product rule. It's a product rule problem now. x is a function in its own right. y is assumed to be a function of x. Right? Don't forget, just from this request, just from a request for this form, I know that I'm assuming that y is a function of x. So this becomes an example of the product rule. So according to the product rule, I've got this 3 out front. That's still going to be sitting there. So the derivative of x times y, well, the derivative of x is 1. And then x times the derivative of y. Well, we don't have an explicit form for the function y, so the derivative is just going to be represented by the differential dy dx. And now, this 3 can be distributed. So 3y, 3x, dy dx. So that's what goes in. So now we've got to be careful because, again, because the variable y is part of the expression, I have to make sure that I'm applying the appropriate rule. Uh, for the y squared, it's a chain rule. For x times y, it's a product rule. So now I can fill in uh, the missing pieces. Uh, 2x from the derivative of the first term. This middle term gave me two terms. 3y plus... And there's the term by term. All the derivatives have been computed. This guy in the middle comes from that middle term. Uh, so watch out for that. Um, uh, we've got to get used to uh, that idea that we must now assume that y is a function of x in order to um, apply the appropriate rule when we're taking derivatives. Uh, and now uh, the last step, uh, all, the, all the differentiation all the differentiation has been done, now the rest of it is algebra. I've got to solve this equation for dy dx by moving things around, getting things, uh, getting the dy dx operator isolated on its own side of the equation. So let's see what's going to be involved there. Uh, number one, anything that doesn't involve dy dx has to be moved over. So uh, let me do it. Let me get a new page. Here. So let's go ahead and start that process. In fact, let me go ahead, starting from here. Let's make sure we understand exactly how we get to the result. Step one, anything that doesn't involve the derivative has to be moved over. So I'm going to subtract the 2x and the 3y because those terms don't involve the differential I'm trying to solve for. Uh, now, uh, well right now, I've got two different occurrences of the differential that I'm trying to solve for. In the end, I've got to have a statement that says dy dx is equal to something, dy dx now being isolated. Uh, so, with that in mind, what's the next step? Factor out the common factor. That's the way I reduce the two occurrences to one. So, factoring out dy dx allows me to rewrite this in terms of the um, differential and now the last step uh, divide out so that 3x minus 2y that becomes the multiplier now becomes the divisor so in the end what do I have uh, well I've got the negative of 2x minus 3y up on top and I've got 3x minus 2y down on the bottom there's the derivative of y with respect to x. And again, the derivative itself still occur, still contains y. I never did get an explicit uh, definition of what y was, but it doesn't matter. Any questions that I need to answer about the behavior of this derivative can be answered as long as any given point can be identified. And points can all be identified from the original formula. Um, so these are involved types of problems because of that extra step that comes through the solution in terms of the differential. It's a lot of work to do. 
and the rules now uh, are, look very different. Uh, any occurrence of the dependent variable has to be treated differently from derivatives applied to the independent variable. Let's try this one. Um, now, turn, we're going to look at an example of, the, of uh, this type of equation here. Turns out this equation is familiar. It does generate a familiar sort of graph. Uh, but once I get to something like this, uh, I don't know, I have no idea what this graph, you know, if I was... No, that's not right. What does that say? Why is there a zero there? It's supposed to be a zero there. Um, it's supposed to be... Oh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. That is right. I'm sorry. That's the equation. That's the equation that we're trying of the function that defines the function. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay, but again, uh, I've got y and x mixed up. <coughs> Each one occurs in its own part of the formula. Um, in order to graph this, I have to. Well, in fact, uh, I don't know. I think I, I think our calculus will graph a, a graph like this. Uh, but we'd have to rewrite it in a different form, so I don't know. But anyway, uh, I don't need to know what this graph looks like to answer this question. What's the derivative of y if y itself is considered to be a function of x? So once again, by requesting the information in this form, I'm making the assumption that y is the dependent variable and x is independent. So once again, in order to find this derivative, I'm going to go term by term. So the derivative of the cosine of 2y uh, minus of the derivative of 2 sine x and finally the derivative of the constant 0. Now two of these are simple. The derivative of the constant as usual goes to 0 and the derivative here, that's just our normal differentiation law. That's just derivative of 2 sine x, x being the independent variable. What's the derivative of 2 sine x? The only issue comes here. The derivative now of this expression that involves the dependent variable. How do I take the derivative here? Well, this becomes a chain rule problem. 2y becomes the inner function of composition. y itself being a function even though I don't have an explicit definition for it in terms of the independent variable. So according to the chain rule, what happens? Well, I get the negative of sine for the derivative of cosine. And then uh, the uh, derivative evaluated at the inner function, that's the same. But then the extra factor is the derivative of that inner function. So I still need the derivative of 2y to fill out that result from the chain rule. So once again, uh, treating the argument as if it were the simple variable, the usual d derivative, and this extra factor that's generated by applying the chain rule to the implicit assumption that f uh, that y is a function of x. What is the derivative of 2y with respect to x? 2 dy dx. The derivative of two, the constant just sits there the derivative of y with respect to x, well, that's just what we call dy dx. And now I'm ready to solve this equation for the differential. I'm going to move the uh, term that involves cosine over. By adding and then I'll divide through by the um, multiplier of the differential, the whole thing, minus 2 sine of 2y. And at that last step, uh, the 2's cancel away. Let's 
So on the N, I can express dy in simplest form the negative of cosine x divided by the sine of 2y. Okay. That wasn't too bad. Uh, I didn't have to apply the check, uh, product rule or anything like that in this case. Uh, the only place that I really had to be careful was that first term, where I've got to treat that uh, 2y as the inside function of composition through the chain rule. And then comes all the work. And then after that, it's all algebra, right? In every one of these cases, we'll have to do the algebra required to isolate or to solve the equation for the differential. And uh, that's the algebra part of it. Um, oh, and here's a typical sort of question we ask about graphs. I have no idea what this graph looks like, uh, but uh, whatever it looks like, uh, the point zero 02 is on the graph, what would the slope of the tangent line be uh, for uh, this point of the graph of this equation? And again, I assume, I'm not sure, but I assume this equation is not itself going to generate a uh, function. Um, <coughs> so, if I need the slope of the tangent line, what do I need? <coughs> Let's verify this, though. Let's verify that, that this point really does belong to the graph. Um, so that's what I want to do first. Let's, let's actually verify that the point zero 02 is on the graph. If it is, then if I substitute uh, x with 0 and y with 2, I should get a true statement. So let's check that e to the uh, 2 times e to the 0 times 2 is that equal to 0 plus 2? Is that true? Yeah. Because this is e to the 0, this is 2, e to the 0 is equal to 1, so yeah. I do get a true statement of the substitution. So uh, that does verify that this is a point on the graph. It's not as obvious now, and again we need both coordinates in the context of the um, implicit derivative, so that's not an uh, arbitrary type of thing. There's that verification. Okay, so if I want to find the slope of the tangent line, as usual, I'm going to have to have the derivative, and uh, in particular, in our, in our graphing space in particular, if we're talking about slopes of lines, then we're assuming the standard uh, setup, x being independent, y being dependent. So as usual, I'm going to take derivatives with respect to the independent variable term by term. Okay. The right hand side is easy. What's the derivative of x itself? 1. And what's the derivative of y with respect to x? Well, I don't know, but I know what it's called. It's called dy dx. Okay, that's easy. The tricky part is going to be right here. So let's see, what can we say about the derivative of this thing here? So I'm going to work this out down here. Uh, first of all, the um, 2 is constant multiplier, so I'm going to pull it out front. It doesn't really enter into the process of the derivative. Okay. Now I'm taking the derivative here, e to the power of the product It's a composite function, it's the inner function of composition so by the chain rule, what's this going to look like? Uh, according to the rule for the exponential, e to the x is its own derivative so e to the xy comes back to us and then by the chain rule, I've got the derivative of that inside function of composition. So e to the xy, that's just a typical uh, uh, power generalization of the power rule, of the exponential rule for the natural base. And then through the chain rule, I get that extra factor of uh, the derivative of that product. And so once again, the 
product rule is going to have to be used. And we've already done that. <coughs> we showed earlier that this ends up being equal to uh, y, 1 times y plus x times dy dx. And so this piece here comes from the product rule. So that's what that left-hand side of the equation turns out to be. I get the uh, exponential form, comes right back as always, but that extra term now, that binomial expression, comes from the product rule being applied to, the pr to that inner function of composition. So in the end, I've got all this. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and uh, distribute. I'm going to have to do that anyway because I've got to get that uh, dy dx separated from the other term. So the right-hand side, once I distribute, becomes this. So there's distributing the two e to the xy across both terms. And over here, I already showed, I've got 1 plus dy dx. <coughs> now, I'll, now, I've done all the calculus involved in this problem. Now I'm going to start moving things around. I'm going to try and get dy dx isolated and all terms that don't involve the differential on their own side. So I guess I'll go this way. I'll move this guy over to the right and this guy over to the left. So I'm going to subtract 2y, e to the xy, and dy dx from both sides. So at the end of that process, what do we have? On the left-hand side, I get that. And on the right-hand side, I get that. So I just separated the two terms, two types, to their own sides. Then the factorization, the common factor dy dx can be removed. And then the last step, divide out the factor. And so in the end, in simplest form, the derivative of this expression is this. Right. I didn't see any mistakes. There. Ah, there is a mistake in here. That's on my two. It's supposed to be a two there, right? Yeah, it's supposed to be a two there. Two x. So there's supposed to be a two there. It's supposed to be a two there. It's supposed to be a two there. Yeah, that's right, I think. Okay, we're not finished, right? Uh, all of that work was just getting down to the point where now we can identify this value. Now, I finally reached the point where I can actually tell you uh, what the slope of this tangent line is. So the actual slope of the tangent line is going to be the derivative evaluated at the point 0, 2. Was that what it was? 0, 2. Yeah, 0, 2. And so now I'm going to go down in this formula and everywhere I see an x, I'm going to replace it with 0. And everywhere I see a y, I'm going to replace it with 2. So 2 times 2 e to the 0 times 2. And on the bottom, 2 times 0 times e to the 0 times 2 minus 1. So let's see what happens here. Uh, that whole term goes to 0 because it's got a 0 factor. And e to the 0 goes to 1. 
So what do I have left? I've got 1 minus 4 over 0 minus 1. 3. There it is. Slope the tangent line. This curve at this point is 3. Once again, very different from what we've been doing up to this point. These require both the values of x and y be known because in the implicit case, I don't have an explicit representation for the function y, so I have to make those substitutions in the appropriate places. Good. But these are involved problems now, right? Everything is getting more complex. We're building on top of what we've already learned. So every step along the way now, uh, this level of complexity becomes more and more significant. Uh, and finally, let's do uh, one last thing. Uh, here's the typical, uh, the other part, right? Uh, again, when we talk about abstract um, tangent lines and their slopes all come from the derivative. Uh, and here's the other property of tangent lines that we like to track, uh, horizontal tangent lines. And in, in fact, we're going to answer both questions. Uh, for this function here, I'm not sure what it looks like. Well, yeah, I do know because I've got a graph of it here. But we're going to look at the graph here in a second. Uh, what does this formula tell us about the horizontal and vertical tangent lines to, to the graph that we're trying to draw here for this equation? Um, so in order to do that, I'm going to have to uh, work out all these details now. <coughs> this question about tangent lines that I know need the derivative. So the first step is to take the derivative of each term in this function one at a time. Oh, in fact, I'll do it like this. Do it like this, I guess. So in the implicit case, and again, I'm making the assumption that x is the independent variable y is dependent, so I'm taking the derivative with respect to x. And now, what are we going to get? Well, these two over here on the little right-hand side, those are easy, we've already done those. Uh, the derivative of the constant is zero, so that's gone. And the derivative of the product, right? We've already done that a couple of, well, we did it once. Uh, we found that was going to be y plus x times dy dx. So that piece of the formula comes from the product rule. Uh, but on the other side, what rule do I need? Chain rule. So according to the chain rule, uh, the usual power form, so 2x plus y to the first. And then the derivative of that inside function of composition, in this case, the function x plus y, is that inner function. So 2x plus y from the power rule, and then the derivative here, the derivative of x is 1, and the derivative of y is dy dx. Okay, so there. All the derivatives have been applied. Let me think here for a minute. Yeah, I can go ahead and solve. Uh, in, there's a, a one sense in which... Let me think for a minute. Yeah, I, I think I need to go ahead and finish this now. Uh, so th now comes all the algebra. And in this case, the algebra is going to require me to isolate dy dx from uh, all the other terms. So there's a lot of work left to do. Uh, right here, I've got to FOIL. I've got to FOIL this out so that I can get my dy dx out in the open. Um, so x times 1, uh, dy dx, um, y times 1, y times dy dx. And I've still got that same right hand side. Now I've got to collect my terms dy dx, dy dx, dy dx, all these guys have to be on the same side and then I've got to move the others, the 2x, the 2y that don't involve 
those need to go over to the other side. So let's see, what will that look like? Right here. That guy can stay. That guy can stay. And then the minus from moving this term over. So three terms over here on the left-hand side that involve the differential. On the other side, that y there, minus 2y, minus 2x. So in the end, um, well, then factoring. Boy, this is a mess, isn't it? Oh, here, I've got, uh, I've got something I can do here. These two terms are like, so those can be simplified. Is that right? Hmm, something doesn't look right here. Finally, the last step, the uh, factor. And then divide. Okay. Assuming everything's right here, this is where we end up. There's a derivative of y as a function of x within this formula. Okay, now the question is, in order for the tangent line to be horizontal, what has to be true about this derivative? The usual thing, horizontal tangents mean that the, the derivative is equal to zero. Under what conditions will this derivative be equal to zero? The numerator is zero, so that term goes away. I don't need it. Uh, so here is the first condition under which tangent lines will be horizontal. Whenever y is equal to 2x, that means the tangent line itself has to be horizontal, uh, but that still leaves the issue of where does that happen? Where do I actually see this occurring? Uh, it might occur more than once anywhere on this formula where y, oh wait a minute, this should be negative 2x, right? Um, Anywhere where that's true, that's where this equation will be solved. In order to find those locations for this particular function, now I've got to go back to the original equation and replace every occurrence of y with negative 2x. Then I can actually locate where this relationship holds for the given curve. So over here, I'm going to replace y with negative 2x in the original equation. x minus 2x over here. And so what does this end up giving me? x squared is equal to negative 2x squared plus 3. Adding 2x squared to each side. There. So based on the requirement of the derivative being 0 and based on that original equation, there. The two places where x is actually horizontal are x being plus 1, x being minus 1. And let me see here if I can show that. Yeah, here's our, here's our graph. Here's the actual, this is our ellipse. It's trying to be an ellipse. And there they are. Here are those two locations. Here's where the graph, here's where x is positive 1. 
There's a horizontal tangent line. Here's the other location right here. There's where x equals positive one, or sorry, there's where x equals negative one. There's the other location where this graph has a horizontal tangent. Um, uh, I'm not very interested in the second part now. Horizontal, that's, that's, that's the one we really need. That's the one we've been doing all along. I'll skip the vertical tangent lines for now. I don't think that comes up in the homework. But, but there you go. There's an example of this. So that does give us a clue about what this graph looks like. That based on this result, uh, I now do know that if I do look at this graph, that's what I should see. At the locations where x are x is equal to 1. Uh, oh, actually, I, I still need to, you know, actually, I'm not completely finished. Uh, I've got the x value, but I don't have the corresponding y value. I've still got to find that. So that's where this comes in. Right? I already know that y is equal to in terms of x, so this gives me the two points. If x is equal to positive 1, then y is equal to negative 2. And if x is equal to negative 1, then y is equal to positive 2. And so there's those two points. 1, negative 2, negative 1, positive 2. So actually, uh, because there's more than one place on this graph where x is equal to 1. But according to the requirements of this derivative, that's where the horizontal tangent lines can be found. Very involved problem. Differentiating is complicated because we have to track the behavior of the dependent variable. Uh, once I've actually taken derivatives, there's all the algebra involved in trying to get this uh, derivative uh, expressed in function form. Then there's the actual solution to the horizontal tangents. Finding the relationship between x and y that required for the tangent to be horizontal and then using that information to find the exact locations where that occurs. There's all this back and forth between the derivatives, the original formula, setting this to zero, but in the end, we're able to pin down those valuations based on that long sequence of stages. Okay, so there we go. There's uh, some examples of implicit differentiation, the sorts of functions that we use this differentiation formula on, and how it's applied. Okay, good time for a break. I'm going to stop here.